Hi, I'm Herb Gross, and welcome to lecture number 29 in our series, Gateways to Algebra, where today we're going to be talking about factoring. And basically, factoring is sort of a reverse way of looking at multiplication. And in fact, we've done that when we dealt with fractions, looking for common denominators and the like. I suspect that we could use uh, the law of entropy that they talk about in thermodynamics as the motivation for today's lecture, which basically says it's much easier to scramble an egg than to unscramble one. And let's see what that means. Let's suppose I were to say to you, multiply 83 by 79. Now, either with a calculator or longhand, it would not be a difficult task to get that the answer was 6,557. The more difficult thing would be, would be now to give the output, in other words, the product, and ask people to find what the factors were. And by the way, when we say factor, we obviously mean a factor in such a way that neither of these is one, because every number, of course, is one times itself. So the question would be, suppose I said to you, without showing you the top line, what two whole numbers, neither of which is one, must you multiply in order to get 6,557? Can you see the amount of trial and error that would be necessary to solve this problem? Well, you see, what happens is, in algebra, we are going to find that there are times when we deal with polynomial equations, that if we can factor the polynomials, in other words, if we can write a polynomial as a sum, as a product of lower degree pol polynomials, we'll be able to find answers easier. Now, we're going to illustrate that later on when we talk about quadratic equations, but for the time being, let me just show you some examples that we've already had that indicate what factoring is. Remember the distributive property. That said what? If A multiplies B plus C, then the A multiplies the B, and the A also multiplies the C. In other words, A times the quantity B plus C is AB plus AC. Now, the thing is, we mentioned in an earlier program that when we look at relationships like this, we tend to remember them from left to right because that's the order in which we read them. Suppose we now just read this from right to left. Now what we get is what? AB plus AC equals A times B plus C. Here's where the term factoring comes in. If you look at the left-hand side, what do we have here? We have the sum of two terms, AB and AC. Now look at the right-hand side. Remember, everything inside parentheses is one number. We have A, and what's A doing? It's multiplying the parentheses. See, we, that's called factoring, because when we're all through, except for what's inside parentheses, everything else is multiplication. Now, now what we can do in a case like this is to see what happened. How did we get from here to here? Notice that the A, which belonged to both of these expressions, to both of these terms, is now outside the parentheses. And inside the parentheses is what you see when the A is taken out. In other words, leaving out the A here would leave a B. Leaving out the A here would leave a C. So in other words, it's as if we just took an A out of each set of parentheses and brought it outside the parentheses once. By the way, to check this, all you have to do is what? Use the distributive property. This is what? A times B plus A times C, which is exactly what you're supposed to get. In other words, if you take the distributive property, which we write as what? A times B plus C equals AB plus AC. Notice that if you read it from left to right, that's called multiplying. But if you read it from right to left, that's called factoring. Now let's just see how that particular principle works. Here's a polynomial. It has two monomials in there, right? It's 3x squared plus 4x. Okay. Now, let's take a look and see what happens over here. But what do we say? If a factor appears in both terms, we can take it out. Well, what's another way of writing x squared? Isn't that x times x? So now we take a look over here. There's a 3 here, but there's no 3 here. There's an x here. There's an x here. That means x is now a common factor. What can we do? Take the x outside. See? Take, one x, take the x from here, the x from here, and bring it out once outside the parentheses. Now what's left inside? 3x plus 4. And by the way, you can always check that you've done this right, because now just multiply and see what happens. x times 3x is 3x squared. Uh, x times 4 is 4x. By the way, to show you why this is important, let's suppose for the sake of argument that this result was supposed to be 0. There's lots of numbers that add up to 0. But if this is just another name for this, 
Look at the exciting thing. We're going to look at this in more detail later on. But for now, notice what happens over here. Here is what? One number, which we call x, multiplied by another number called 3x plus 4, and that product is 0. What does it mean if the product of two numbers is 0? It means that at least one of those numbers must be 0. So either x must be 0, or else 3x plus 4 must be 0. And notice that those are both linear equations which can be solved. In other words, this is a second-degree polynomial equation, and by factoring, we can break it down into simpler problems that we've already solved. That's just an aside right now, because I'm going to do that in more detail later in the course. But let's just practice some more. See, let's see how we can factor over here. You see, the smallest number of x's, in other words, the smaller degree, can always be factored out. Let me see, see if I can show you what I mean over here. See. What can x to the fourth be written as compared to x squared? Isn't x to the fourth just x squared times x squared? If I rewrite this in this form, do you see that x squared is a factor of both the first term and the second term? And if I take the x squared out, uh, outside here, that's x squared, what's left inside? 3x squared plus 4. Again, the check, x squared times 3x squared is 3x to the fourth x squared times 4 is 4x squared. And by the way, if you don't want to take these out all at once, you can still do this thing gradually. For example, take 3x to the fourth plus 4x squared. What can you see right away? Right away, you can see there's at least an x in both of these, because x to the fourth is what? It's x times x to the third, and x squared is x times x. So take out an x. If I take out the x, one from each term, what's left inside? 3x to the third plus 4x. But x to the third is the same as what? x times x squared. So there's an x here and an x here. That means I can do what? Take out another x. See, now there's two x's outside. x times x happens to be x squared. What's left inside? 3x squared plus 4. Be careful, you can't take this x squared outside the parentheses, because you can only take it out if it's a constant, uh, if, if it's a common factor. For example, l let's suppose you thought that it was OK to take out the x squared. Suppose you said, I'm going to take out the x squared, and the answer is going to be this. Well, see, the idea is what? If you took out the x squared, this would now become what? 3x squared plus 4x squared. That would be 7x squared. And that's not the same as 3x squared plus 4. It would be the same as 3x squared plus 4x squared. You see what happens over here? The x squared is multiplying only the 3. When you pull the x squared out, and put it in front of the parentheses, the x squared by the distributive property is going to multiply everything that's inside the parentheses. So again, notice that by remembering the rules and working backwards, you're going to be able to guard against careless mistakes. Now, sometimes there's going to be more than two terms in an in, in a, uh, expression. See, let's look over here. Here's 5x to the sixth plus 3x to the fourth plus 2x cubed. What is that? That's a polynomial of degree 6. Now, let's see if we can do this a little bit faster. See, what is the smallest degree in here? Isn't it the third? So what we're going to do is emphasize the x to the third. How can you write x to the sixth? x to the sixth is what? x to the third times x to the third. How can you emphasize x to the third when you're talking about x to the fourth? x to the fourth is x to the third times x to the first, because we're just adding exponents when we multiply. Now, can you see at a glance that x to the third power is a common factor in each of these three terms. So what do we do? We remove it. In other words, we take out the x to the third here, the x to the third here, the x to the third here. That comes outside. Now what's left inside the parentheses when we remove the x to the third from each term? It's 5x to the third plus 3x plus 2. And by the way, again, notice all you have to do is multiply this out to check this. This would now become what? 5x to the sixth plus 3x to the fourth plus 2x to the third. And do you see why this is called factoring? This is a, mo a monomial, which is actually a polynomial, right, of degree 3. And this is also a polynomial of degree 3. And hence what we've done is we've taken a polynomial of degree 6 and written it as the product of two third degree polynomials. Now this comes in handy in terms of arithmetic. For example, here's a fairly complicated expression. 5x to the sixth plus 3x to the fourth plus 2x to the third over 4x to the fourth. Okay? This is an algebraic fraction. Now, how do you reduce fractions? If there's a common factor in both the top and the bottom, we can cancel it. Now, the key word is factor. See, for example, is the 4 over here 
multiplying the entire denominator? Yes. Now, d don't two and four have a factor in common? The thing you have to be careful about is that the two multiplies the x to the third power. It is not a factor of the entire numerator. So you can only cancel a common factor. Is there a common factor here? Didn't we just show that x to the third was a common factor of the numerator? And that w when we took out x to the third, what was left? What was left was what? 5x to the third plus 3x plus 2. So the numerator has something times x to the third. Can we factor an x to the third out of the denominator? See, 4x to the fourth is the same as what? 4x times x to the third. Now what can I do? See, now the x to the third is doing what? On top, it's multiplying the entire numerator. On the bottom, it's multiplying the entire denominator. Therefore, it's a common factor. I can now cancel it out. By the way, one little disclaimer. The only denominator you're not allowed is 0. So we're assuming over here that x is not 0. You see, if x was 0, each of these terms would be 0. We would have 0 over 0, and that's not defined, as we talked about earlier. So in other words, the expression 5x to the sixth plus 3x to the fourth plus 2x to the third over 4x to the fourth is mathematically equivalent to the somewhat simpler expression 5x to the third plus 3x plus 2 over 4x. And sometimes, by simplifying an expression, you can make your life a lot easier. Let me show you uh, an, uh, this in terms of an example. Suppose I said to you, evaluate 2x to the fourth plus 4x cubed over 2x to the third when x is 3.147. Now, the brute force way of tackling this problem is to say, oh, I'll just replace x by 3.147. So this is going to be what? 3.147 to the fourth power times 2. This will be 3.147 to the third power times 4. I'll add those up. Then I'll divide by what? 3.147 to the third power times 2. And especially if you didn't have a calculator, can you visualize how complex this would look? How much? Not difficult, but cumbersome. But watch what we can do instead. We notice that in both of these terms, 2 is a factor. See, 2 goes into 2, 2 goes into 4. So we can take a 2 out. We also notice that there are at least three factors of x in each of these terms. So we can take out an x to the third power. If we take out 2x to the third power, what's left? We've taken out the 2. We've taken out three of the four factors of x. That leaves us with one factor of x. What have we done over here? We've taken out a 2, so that still leaves us a 2 in here. We've taken out three factors of x but there only were three factors of x over here, so nothing else is left here. And by the way, if you want to double check it, 2x to the third times x is 2x to the fourth. 2x to the third times 2 is 4x to the third. Now what happens? See, no, by, by the way, whenever no factor appears, you can always assume this being multiplied by 1. So what happens now? 2x to the third is a common factor of the numerator. 2x to the third is a factor of the denominator. I can therefore cancel it. And all I'm left with is x plus 2, again assuming that x is not 0. Now, what's kind of amazing over here is this whole complicated expression is nothing more than x plus 2. So when, if somebody says to me, evaluate this expression here when x is 3.147, all I have to do is what? Replace x by 3.147 in here, and that just says what? Take 3.147, add on 2, that's 5.147, and that's the answer. And you see, again, what we're saying? Even if you have no practical reason for studying algebra, the art of paraphrasing, the ability to take complicated statements and replace them by simpler yet equivalent statements is what you do throughout your whole life. Whenever you have a problem that you can't solve, a major strategy is to paraphrase that problem into smaller pieces, each of which is solvable. And so all this has done, if you're not even interested in math per se, is to show you how by knowing a few rules of the game, we can basically take very complicated expressions and reduce them to much simpler expressions. Uh, by the way, you know, we have made a fetish over uh, the idea that polynomial arithmetic can be viewed as place value. I thought, to, in, the, in the name of being consistent, I should do that with this problem over here also. Remember what problem we were doing? We were taking what? 2x to the fourth plus 4x to the third over 2x to the third. And we showed that that reduced to what? x plus 2. <coughs> Let's do this problem 
the way it's meant to be done. Uh, what does this mean? Whenever you have a fraction, it means you're dividing the denominator into the numerator. Let's write this in place value notation. The 2 is in the x to the third place. How do we show people in place value that this is the x cubed place? We put a 0 in the x squared place, a 0 in the x place, and a 0 in the 1's place. Now, what's inside? What's, what's the uh, dividend? Okay, It's 2x to the fourth plus 4x to the third. So what is there? There's a 2 in the x to the fourth place. There's a 4 in the x to the third place. And to show that this is x to the third, we also say what? There are no x squareds, no x's, and no 1's. Now, let's do this problem as if it were a regular long division problem. 2,000 goes into 2,400 once. 1 times 2,000 is 2,000. We subtract. The remainder is 400. We bring down the 0. 2,000 goes into 4,000 twice with no remainder. So it looks like we've just done a, a straightforward arithmetic problem here. But remember, instead of 1s, 10s, 100s, we're now dealing with what? 1s x is x squared. So what's the answer over here? There are two ones and one x, and so notice that the answer is x plus 2, the same as we got doing it the other way. We're going to come back to this a little bit later. Uh, it, in fact, it'll be the next lecture, I think, when we talk about what happens when things don't factor the way they should. But again, let me uh, show you some more things that might be interesting. You see, every time you learn a special product, all you have to do is read it from right to left, and you have a factoring result. See, remember we learned last time that if you square a plus b, it's a squared plus 2ab plus b squared? Well, just read this in reverse. This says if you have a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, okay, that that's just the square of a plus b. In other words, if I have three terms, and I notice that one of them is a perfect square, the other one is a perfect square, and the third term is twice the product of the terms that are being squared, I can write it in this form over here. In a similar way, I know that a minus b squared is what? a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. So if I read that from right to left, that's a squared minus 2ab plus b squared equals a minus b squared. So now it gives me another factoring. See why it's called factored? The right-hand side is just a product. The left-hand side is a sum. Actually, sum and difference, but a difference is the same as a sum because subtracting is the same as adding the opposite. See, didn't we also learn that uh, when you multiply a plus b by a minus b, the answer is a squared minus b squared? Read that from right to left, and that tells you what? That a squared minus b squared is a plus b times a minus b. Now, watch how, how that can work for us. Suppose I want to reduce this to simpler terms. I have x squared minus 4 over x squared plus 4x plus 4. You know, later in the course, we'll worry about where do you get these kind of expressions. They all come from word problems where you translate something into a, you translate the recipe, and sometimes you're going to wind up with a form like this. Well, what about x squared minus 4? This is a perfect square. This is a perfect square, and we're subtracting. So this is going to be what? x plus, see, what's the square root of x squared? It's just x. What's the square root of 4? It's 2. So what are we doing over here? We're multiplying x plus 2 times x minus 2. And again, whenever you're in doubt, just multiply the thing out. x times x is x squared. x times minus 2 is minus 2x. 2 times x is 2x. The 2x and the minus 2x cancel. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4, so we get x squared minus 4. What about the bottom? x squared is a perfect square. It comes from squaring x, doesn't it? 4 is a perfect square. It comes from squaring 2. Ah, if you multiply these two together and double it, that's going to give you what? 2 times x times 2 is 4x. That's exactly the formula that says what? That this denominator here is x plus 2 squared. Another way of writing x plus 2 squared is x plus 2 times x plus 2. Now, here's where the parentheses are important. Remember, everything in parentheses is one number. Therefore, is the entire factor x plus 2 multiplying the top? Yes, it's multiplying x minus 2. Is x plus 2 multiplying the rest of the denominator over here? Yes, it's multiplying x plus 2. Therefore, is there a common factor here? Remember, everything inside the parentheses is one number. What's inside this set of parentheses? x plus 2. What's inside this set of parentheses? Also x plus 2. Therefore, I can do what? Cancel them, and what that tells me is 
is that this expression over here is just the same as saying what? x minus 2 over x plus 2. Now, isn't this a lot easier to handle than this? This just says what? Divide 2 less than a number by 2 more than a number. That's all this thing says. That's a lot simpler than writing this. And by the way, again, the disclaimer is what? The only time you can't divide is when there's a 0. So you want to in indicate over here that x plus 2 cannot be 0. And that says that x cannot equal negative 2. By the way, understanding factoring often helps us do some cute tricks. Remember I told you in a previous uh, lecture that you see these programs where people show you fast ways to do math? Every one of those fast ways has its derivation in something that we see algebraically. Uh, here's one I learned probably in about the fifth or sixth grade, and I was always fascinated by it because I, I didn't think it should always work. It, it was how you square a number that ends in 5. See, suppose I want to square 85. What the recipe says is put a bar between the 5 and the rest of the number. Now, what you do is 5 squared is 25. Look at the rest of the number. It's an 8, isn't it? What's 1 more than 8? 9. Now multiply the 8 times the 9. What does that come out to be? 72. So 85 times 85 is 7,225. A cute little trick. For example, what's 125 squared? Write down the 125. Draw that line that separates the 5 from the rest. What's 1 more than 12? 13. What's 13 times 12? 156. Replace the 5 by 5 squared. What do you get? 1, 5, 6, Two, five. That's 15,625. So in other words, to square 125, that's 15,625. Do, uh, do you understand the nature of this little trick? Do you see what we're saying? By the way, is that a very practical thing to know? Not really, because with the advent of a calculator, you can square 85 very quickly. Just enter 85 on the calculator and press the x squared key. If you want to, if you want to square 195, just enter 195 on the calculator and press the x squared key. So in terms of quickness, there's no real advantage to this. But it is interesting, isn't it? It stimulates the mind. Why does this work? And let's just take a look at that from the point of view of a little bit of algebra over here. You see, when you write 85, do you see what that 8 is? That 8 is really doing what? It's being multiplied by 10. OK? See, in other words, w w when suppose t stood for the, the place value numeral after the 5 was disregarded. What does it mean by putting the t after the 5? Doesn't it mean that that's in the tens place? So in terms of place value, this would be 10t plus 5, right? So for example, if you had 125, I think that's the one we did before. If I did this, in this example, what would t be? t would be 12. And by putting the 5 over here, do you see what you've done? It's really been what? You've multiplied the 12 by 10 and add on 5. See, by putting a 5 over here, you've automatically pushed the 12 up by one denomination. But we, we won't worry about that right now. So what we want to do in algebra is forget about the 8, forget about the 12. Let's call t the tens, the tens place. So a t followed by 5 abbreviates what? 10t plus 5. OK? Now, how do you, how do you square 10t plus 5? Isn't it going to be the first term squared? plus twice the product of these two terms, plus the last term squared. So 10t squared, 10t times 10t is 100t squared. Twice this product, 5 times 10t is 50t, times 2 is 100t. And then you square 5 is 25. Well, so far, so good. By the way, there, the 25 is a common factor here. But I have to, here's where critical thinking comes in. I don't want to factor out the 25 here, because somehow that 25 is going to appear in the final answer when we square something. So I want the 25 to be intact. What about these two terms over here? Isn't 100t a common factor of these two terms? If I take out 100t from here, this term has a t left in it, and this term has nothing left. Whenever there's nothing left, it's always assumed to be a 1. And by the way, you can check this because 100t times t is 100t squared. 100t times 1 is 100t. So this is the same as this so far. But, how, but look at t. Wasn't t the tens digit? What's t plus 1? Isn't that 1 more than t? So for example, if the tens digit was 8, what's t plus 1? 9. 
So 8 times 9 would be 72. What are you going to do that 72? I'm going to multiply that by 100. But one way to multiply 72 by 100 is just to put the 25 next to it. Because you see what this has done? By putting the 25 over here, the 2 now modifies hundreds. So this is what? 72 hundred, 25. You see, you see what I'm saying over here? This is the value of place value and also the value of knowing how to factor. In other words, by knowing, in fact, this is probably a good place to close and to summarize. Uh, in addition to this stuff being practical, there's a lot of fun involved here. Well, you may say, how, how can algebra be fun? Uh, anything that makes you say, wow, why does that work? And then you can see why it works is a very interesting situation. It's given your mind a chance to see something that you wouldn't have recognized otherwise. Something that, in fact, it's possible that by fooling around with the algebra, you're going to notice relationships that you don't notice in dealing with arithmetic. Why? Because in algebra, you're working symbolically with numbers like A and B, whereas in arithmetic, you're working with specific numbers, and specific numbers sometimes block what's happening in general. But at any rate, uh, I hope you now understand what factoring is. Uh, in our next lesson, we're going to say, what do you do when you can't factor? And that's where long division comes in. So in our next lecture, we're going to talk about dividing polynomials. But until that time, study hard, have fun, stay young. See you soon.